Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Jennifer Granick, and I am the thank you, and I am the civil liberties director at the Stanford Center for Internet and Society. Uh, welcome to our panel this morning on smashing the future for fun and profit. Um, how many of you have seen the McLaughlin Report, McLaughlin Group show? <laughs> okay, I'm John McLaughlin this morning. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All of you are wrong. I'm John McLaughlin this morning, and what we're going to do is we're going to have a free and uh, frank discussion about where security is today and what we see coming in the near future um, and for the next 15 years. So this is the uh, 15th year of Black Hat, and I have with me here on the stage some other people who also presented at the first Black Hat. 15 years ago, um, and I'm going to, they, they really need no introduction, I'll say their names, and if you're wondering where we were and what we looked like 15 years ago, you need only look at the slides on the screens uh, above me. Okay, so we have Jeff Moss, Adam Shostak, myself, Bruce Schneier, and Marcus Raynham. And so without much ado, we're just going to get right into the conversation, and uh, I'm going to start with the present. So we're going to look into the future, but let's see if we can talk about where everybody thinks we are today. Um, what kind of security problems are we doing well with? Have we been successful, and uh, what, what kind of success could we maybe build on? Marcus, let me ask you that question first. Well, I think we've done a good job with all of the stuff that's knowledge-based, all of the technologies where you basically have a, a research team that is generating some set of you know, antivirus signatures, firewall signatures, malware signatures, whatever. We're really good at that. The, the hard part, the, the thinking part, that's kind of where we, we're, we're still stuck. I mean, he's right. Spam is probably one of our greatest success stories. I mean, I barely get spam anymore. And spam is an enormous part of, uh, of email. So signatures there, I mean, right, viruses, you keep your antivirus up to date, and you're, you really are pretty good. And those, those things work. I mean, everybody knows I should have an AV program. So why can't we just keep doing more of what we're already doing? Why don't we just do more research, more bug finding, more vulnerabilities, you know, build that knowledge base and keep going the way we've been going? Any thoughts? That doesn't work against an innovative attacker. That only works against the, the attacks that are happening in the large. And so, are, are we doing everything we could with the technology we have today, or is there, or are we going to have to, what could we do better with what we know and what we have as tools to I, fight those today? Yeah, I, I think there's certain, almost like tragedy to commons type problems that we don't do well with. So, if you look back at the old RFCs, there's an RFC for secure SMTP. You know, who uses that? You know, there's uh, RFCs for uh, BCP38 or SAC04 about egress filtering for spoofed source addresses. One of the biggest problems we have with botnets and floods is because we allow spoofed traffic under our network. Well, that's been a recommendation for 15 or more than 15 years, and we still allow that uh, you know, spoof traffic out of our networks, adding to the problem. So I think where there's a market problem and there's some money to be had, we're really great at innovating a product. When it's sort of like the common good for a common society, we're not so hot. We're well, still using passwords for crying out loud. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but he's, he's actually really right. A lot of these major security failures end up, when you look at them, are actually market failures. That the, the person who's suffering the loss isn't in a position to fix the problem, the person in a position to fix the problem isn't suffering the loss. And, and when you have those situations, it doesn't matter how good your technology is, it's not going to get deployed. So there's another element to that, which is the people who are suffering the loss are often not talking about the loss. They're covering up those problems. And I think we actually have an opportunity to, to talk about the future a little bit, to, go, to think about assume breach and say, hey, if we're going to assume breach, why don't we talk about what went wrong in some sort of way so that we can actually look at these things and say, is there a failure? Well, what do you mean when you're talking about who's talking about the loss? You mean that companies should notify us when our personal data is stolen, like the California breach notification law? Or are you talking about something like, you know, post-mortems, the way that medical uh, you know, doctors or, do after Or, or a good example would be airplane crashes. If there's an airplane crash, there's an investigation, a report, and everybody gets to learn from the failure. I mean, you know, Citibank, I'm making this up, loses a bunch of hundred million dollars. They don't even mention it. So we can learn from it. We can improve. We don't even know what happened. And, and maybe some of the time, they don't even know what happened. Right? We, we always have this disconnect. You, when you're breached, you can either recover quickly or do forensic analysis. You often can't do both. And companies very often, they, they want to recover. They want to get back in business. And what happened and can we learn from it and can the industry get better 
is really a secondary concern. Well, you know, also the, the reward structure and the punishment structure seems to be wrong. You know, you hear about such and such a bank got fined for, for doing something wrong. But, you know, it was my credit card information that they lost. I want the money. Where does the <laughs> fine go? You know, the fine goes to the FTC or something like this. I, I want the money. If I was actually getting the money, I might care a little bit. So um, I guess we should maybe be thankful then for the cloud because, you know, if I'm not the one who's responsible now for maintaining my network and all this stuff is going to be done sort of out there, all we need is a couple of good providers who actually take this kind of stuff seriously and it's really a service that they're going to be selling me. And, and so in the future, maybe a lot of these problems in terms of, you know, implementing the knowledge that we have are, is going to be resolved. Although that's not what we're seeing. I mean, and, and I'd like that to happen. I think there is a lot of potential benefit for, for going out in the cloud and potential risk. Risks. But right now, you talk to a cloud provider and say, you know, can I audit your systems? Can I see what security you're using? They say, they, they'll say no. And if you look at the, your license, they don't take any liability. It, you know, we're really now making it worse, where this, now your security is opaque. You can't see it. You can't control it. Well, and your terms of service sometimes prevent you from actually testing. Like, right. you run security <laughs> tools against your own cloud instance... You'd be violating your terms of service. Yeah. Go try auditing Not to mention the CFAA. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Remember like that. it's like dark energy. It's there. You just have to trust me. That's right. <laughs> and I, I know some people that were using the dark energy of the cloud. They're like, well, I don't really use the cloud the way it was intended, but I use it as a giant DDoS mitigation. I just host my <laughs> and I let the cloud provider worried about the big flows. It's like that was the cheapest DDoS protection you could buy for a while was hosting it in the cloud. That's pretty awesome, though. Yeah. You know, it's, if, if there's the problem, there's a, there's a fix for the problem. Yeah. It's good. Well, when you guys say market failure, the political scientist in me says government. That's what the government's for, is to cure the market failure. So um, what do you see as the role of the, for the government evolving here? And just to kind of give it a little background, what we've seen just in the past you know, couple of months over the summertime is that Congress is considering a number of cybersecurity bills. There's CISPA, there's the revised cybersecurity, Act. And the hallmark of these bills, there's a lot of um, stuff about the way that government will be organized in order to who's going to be in charge and that kind of thing. But there's really two main components to each of these bills that government's grappling with. One is information sharing and the other is standards, security standards and what to do to try to get critical infrastructure and or other kind of private networks to come up to snuff and to, you know, meet these standards. So um, these, this, there's a lot in there, but let's ask, first of all, generally about government, and then let's talk about information sharing, and then let's talk about standards. So gov is government the solution? Market failure? Government? That's what we do. You know, I, I, it's bad taste to throw rocks at the keynote speaker behind his back, but I'm going to. You know, I, I lose my Especially cool. when he's with the FBI. I lose my cool when I hear people from the government or formerly from the government saying the private sector needs to step up. Excuse me. I'm not qualified to carry on counterintelligence against China or any other country. That's what we pay our taxes for. Providing for the common defense is what the government is supposed to do. If what they're saying is the private sector has to do this, they haven't done their jobs. You're fired. I'm actually, but how do you really feel? <laughs> but, but, I'm actually a big fan of, of government intervention in the right places. I mean, there's a lot of good things government do. Fixing market failures is, is a prime example. When government does well, it tends to legislate results and not methodology. For the government to say you know, something like, you can't employ 12-year-olds in the mines is a perfectly reasonable government standard. I mean, they're not going to tell mine workers how they should work, but they mean you can't do this. For government to say to, I don't know, chemical plants, I'm making this up again, you have to have this level of security, as long as they don't say how to do it, the market will step in and figure out how. Right? The government said in 1976 to credit card companies, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of, what, what the uh, cardholders do, if they lose a credit card, their maximum liability is $50. Right? And then the market stepped in and invented all of this great credit card security you know, that does a lot of good to protect, right? But it does. It does a well, lot no, of good to protect I their think credit card I think you shot yourself companies. in the foot there. Yeah. No, no, the system no. works. Right, but it when was the last work? time you lost a lot of money because I was, your credit card was stolen? I would much prefer loan. our model though than the Japanese model where you're 100% liable for all losses. That, I like $50. Right, because we are not, I mean, I am not in a position to go into Visa's computers and secure my credit card number. Visa is, so they need the liability. 
So the government regulation that shifts liability from me to the credit card companies, they can make the decision, whether it's cheaper to accept the loss or, or, or secure, that's good. That's what government's for. Government does that well. And he's right, government needs to step in and do the national security stuff. So on the, one of the last bills that didn't make it, there was a big section on, on, on information sharing. I don't know if I'm jumping forward here, but, but the, forward if you look at what like, the market forces are there, or, uh, companies are already organizing trust groups, I would call them, uh, or private information sharing exchanges to share vulnerabilities. And, and like the sort of government-sponsored model would be like the FSI are those Are those working? I mean, the FSI SAC is the best of them all. The financial one, right? right, the, right. Others, but, I'm, the others aren't, but there are, there are private trust groups that are very effective. And so what they're trying to do is almost codify that by saying, well, but if it's government-sponsored or government-approved or there's somebody from the government involved, you get a little bit of a liability shield. Well, as soon as you start becoming prescriptive like that, that's when I start worrying because I, mm-hmm. then does that mean you devalue the information in these existing information exchanges because now, well, I don't have the liability unless I go into this formal one that's recognized by this legislation, so therefore everybody else is, you know, the red-headed stepchild... And then now, since it's government approved and there's the government person in there, so the information flows to the government, our conversation will change now. Because now I know Uncle Sam's in the room. So the other ones are less valuable. Uncle Sam's in the room, and it changes the nature of the debate. And so I think the intention is good, liability shield, but in the end, I'm worried about the outcome. I think and also in the way, I'm sorry, in the way that they tr- are trying to effectuate some of this information sharing, some of the, the carrots to draw people in are not healthy for the They're like ding network dongs. as whole. They're right. like, yeah, it looks like a carrot, but it's an orange ding dong. It's going to make <laughs> us all sick. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, the, you know, the information that you get is going to be exempt from FOIA, so other people in the public can't have hold of it. Um, you're going to be immune from liability, when Bruce has just explained why in some cases liability is a great incentive to do uh, stuff correctly. And you know, we have the anecdotal stories from people who represent companies saying that sometimes the government comes in and says, we know your network's been breached, and we'll tell you all about it, but we're going to need your cooperation in doing the investigation. Here's my shiny little ba- black box. Can I put this on your network? And then who knows what happens? And then who knows what happens? And, and I mean, that is a violation of the law, but, you know, that, so, so we really need to be looking at, if we're going to do information sharing, we really need to look at the incentives for information sharing that's public information sharing, where the information is out there. So I know if I'm safe. You know, the people who need to do the remediation know what the situation is, and we all have access to this state-of-the-art technology, and I don't see that happening with these information sharing so I, proposals. I like to talk about information publication, and I like to think about more than just vulnerabilities. You know, we're talking about how do we share this vulnerability data, but there's all sorts of other information that's useful about what is the operations of, say, this government system versus that government system, and we have these opportunities every time a government system is breached. The information is reported to U.S. CERT within an hour. That information is analyzed by the General Accountability Office. They do good work. If we had a little bit more information in those flows, we could actually look and say, hey, you know, this this department is experiencing this sort of problem, and they spend their budget like this. These other folks who are spending their budget differently are not experiencing this problem. We're about this close to getting there. Well, you know, you, you make a really good point because information sharing, in, in order to get information from people, you have to give information. Mm-hmm. That's how you establish the credibility that you can go to somebody and say, hey, give me your net flows, right? I mean, I, I would give Bruce my net flows because I've known him for a long time, but, but that's because I've gotten valuable information from him in return. And what we're seeing from the government is we're seeing an insistence on, we want your information. But yet what we get from them is, you know, well, you're, you're, you know, we found your data outside of your network, but we're going to swear you to silence so you can't talk about this, and we're going to give you some assertions that it was stolen by the Chinese with absolutely no evidence, and we're basically going to make all these evidenceless assertions so the, the security community is flying in the dark on a trust us model, but we're being asked to provide all this information. Until that changes around, there's not going to be any progress in this area at all. There's a perfect example of that I was... Uh, for. DHS, we were going around uh, and having meetings in different uh, states with CISOs, uh, CSOs uh, on the lead up to Cybersecurity Awareness Month a couple, couple years ago. And so it typically goes like this. You're in the room, and the DHS guy speaks and says, this is what DHS is doing. And I speak as sort of the advisor about what I see the future to be. And then the people in the room speak. 
and somebody from a huge hosting provider is you know, really excited to be talking to someone. There's the DHS guy right there in his room. And he's, he's like, well, you know, we see all this activity on our you know, hosted cloud, and we see a lot of stuff flowing back to China, and we see some stuff going to Russia, and we get all these fingerprints, and wow, we've got all this data, and I bet that would be great for you. And, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. <laughs> like, great. And I bet you guys are seeing a lot of stuff happening in the government, and you probably know all this stuff that's happening, right? <laughs> well, you know, at the very, at the very least, at the very least, if DHS simply published it, you know, this is a set of IP addresses that right now, at this moment, we know are exfiltrating data out of the country, and you know, let me have a firewall that can just block those. Yeah, Do or sort of like, a, you know, instead of like a spam house, it would be like the block house, and that IP might be only valid for a couple of days, but you could block that traffic. Yeah, yeah, so more something else, I, uh, something else I want out of government, sort of along these lines. I want them to use their buying power. I mean, yeah. the government is an enormous purchasing agent in, in our industry. And why can't NSA come up with a security standard that they like and they go to go out for bids? You mean, like better. You mean the orange book? <laughs> Sorry? The no, orange no, book? No, I'm not saying better. I'm saying better <laughs> than the orange book. But let them go to the operating system companies, the database companies, the cloud providers, and say, if you want a government business, you have to adhere to this. C2 but, by no, 92. We've got, we've, got that, we've got that with common criteria, and the and trouble not, is there's no feedback. No, so, there, there's no data that feeds into that process. Right, I mean, and when I, there's no data that feeds in, you get a bunch of folks who are very smart folks, very enthusiastic, they write down their best advice, and we never get a feedback loop to discover whether or not it works. Right, I, but, but I, what I, want, I want that loop, and then I want you know, the government to even maybe fund maybe Microsoft to, to do some improvements, and then we all benefit. But okay, so we get there's to that, a, there is a model of this, and so, okay. um, and maybe I'm just speaking because I've paid attention to DHS a little bit more. They spent 20 plus million dollars improving DNSSEC. Mm -hmm. So if DHS as science and technology hadn't spent that money, DNSSEC wouldn't have involved. Well, they're spending millions of dollars right now, and that's secure BGP. Yep. And so I sort of look at them that's as... That's a great idea. Yeah, they're spending money in the areas that companies are not. And when they make those spends and Microsoft gets the benefit of RPKI or SBGP investment and advice, that helps everybody. That's right. back to this right. whole raise all the boats. That's right. And so I'm thinking, well, maybe that's a role for government in these sort of tragedy the common situations where IETF came up with a standard, but it's really in nobody's, you know, ballywick to actually pay for the development. So maybe they jumpstart it and then the market takes it. And I, I really like that idea of DHS, when they procure something, okay, next year it'll need DNSSEC. Right. Or, or, you know, or FISMA. Or PDFs have to get better or just something. Yeah, and Look, you see and that going on with, with FISMA now, with continuous monitoring. Well, that's going to force the market to have to invent all kinds of new products to deal with continuous monitoring. Right. But isn't that a little bit backwards to say, we're going to pass the law that says you need continuous monitoring? It's, it's not even a law. It's not it's, a law. It's just a purchasing requirement. Isn't, yeah. isn't FISMA a, a law? No, uh, only like FISMA high security. If okay. you're critical infrastructure, you have to comply with a FISMA high security. But before we put these standards in place and say you need to buy this, why don't we actually study the problems that we're having? Yes. Oh, right. Adam, <laughs> you academic. <laughs> <laughs> We've think, seen, think first, implement second. Yeah, we've, we've <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, let's, when we're talking about the kind of information that people would want, the kind of information that people need to protect networks, let me ask you about something that the um, keynote speaker said that sort of tr triggered my mind as a civil libertarian. I mean, what kind of information do we need about the attacker? Do we need to know that she has brown hair and she's 28 years old and that her motivation for the attack is she's concerned about you know, global warming from uh, mining in South Saharan well, she, Africa? Or, do we, you know, or is identity really really not what we're looking for. Well, Maybe we're looking for yeah. attribution or something in like his, that. In his example, that was a physical attacker, right? That was a human right. being that the guards would be looking for at that auto plant, right? That was his example. In a cyber attack, I mean, I don't care about hair color. I care about operating system type. Yeah. So it's going to depend on the environment. It, it also, I mean, the trust models all have to be tightened up dramatically. When you're looking at things like, you know, Nippernet with four million authorized <laughs> users who have access to, to the whole nine yards, you know, you, you've got to tighten your trust model up a little bit before those kinds of threat, threat, threat analysis are even worth thinking about. Yeah. What do you mean by tighten your trust model up? Well, I mean, it, it, unfortunately, you know, again, it's one of those cases where the government is doing as I say, not as I do. They're saying, you know, you guys need to hold your data more tightly, but then I, I, I think the thing I really 
really learned from the whole Bradley Manning WikiLeaks affair was that the government still really sucks at handling classified material. But the a- access control is too broad. Yeah. It's way too broad. You simply cannot trust four million users on the network and go, I don't think any one of them is going to leak any data. Yeah, and, and, well, that, but let's keep in mind, too, we're talking about different types of networks here, too. Because, again, you know, for, for certain kinds of networks, for certain kinds of businesses, that works. But we also have to remember that this is an open society. And the thing we all love about the Internet, I think we all love about the Internet, is the Internet is open. And that it's allowed humanity to do stuff that's really awesome, that's never been done before. And we want to take that openness that's the reason why we don't check IDs and frisk everybody when we go to the shopping mall, though we do when we fly at the airport. Airport and, and, and keep that openness in the network. Right. We don't want to have to have everybody be trusted. Yeah, the, the, the FBI model is always, you know, let me see your ID and put your hands where I can see them. Right? Yeah. That, that is the way the FBI thinks. When they see a security problem, they want to identify everybody and see what they got. And that it's not always the, the way you could, should do things. It's not always the best way. But sure, I mean, that, that's what you'll hear. But from an FBI type of person. But you know this is a data custodianship problem. You, you can't run a credit card company and have every one of your employees have access to the credit card database. They have finally learned that, you know? The, the, the State Department and the Department of Defense need to learn that too. Well, well, let's remember why they opened that up to so many people. It's because of the 9-11 Commission, which said there were too many information silos and that information wasn't getting to the people who needed it. So yeah, there's sharing, attention. you're doing it wrong, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so it's a pendulum, though, right? It's, yep. Went too far in one direction, now it's going to swing back to compartmentalization. But, uh, to Jeff, the point how can the pendulum swing, ba- swing back? I mean, is this, you know, sort of the, the, the horses are out of the barn now? It's like the databases are there, all the information's been aggregated, all these different people in government, whether it's law enforcement or national security or I, you know, whatever but has the, it. I mean, I fear Google more than I fear pretty much the government. Because at least I... That's I've got, just the coast you're living I've, I've on. Got co- yeah, I've got <laughs> causes of action against, against the government. There's, like, decades of, of, of legal history there. Like, when Google's online confident. providers, I'm contractually agreeing to give them all my data. Right, or, or even you're not, right? You, yeah. There's it, no actual contract. You're just giving it to them because they have a cool name and a cool website. Well, people, people ask me, why do you use Tor? And it's like, well, I don't really care too much about Tor, I care about my local cable provider watching my pro and injecting JavaScript ads or something. Or do, it's like, I don't need my local provider target marketing to me, so I use Tor to get one hop away from like that, the badness of my provider I'm paying money to. You think, but you think the commercial entities are scarier than the government because advertising is the wave of the future. And they're well, it's the only model. ad model, the revenue model. Yeah. And so I, I remember someone was saying that we've taken the best and brightest minds and converted them into getting better click-through rates. Yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's like, you know, the innovators of our current generation are working on conversion rates. It's like that's not the best use of their time. Well, let's take a little poll of ourselves in the audience. Who fears Google more than the government? Yeah. Okay, who fears the government more than Google? I'm the only one. Oh, there you go. Thank, <laughs> thank I mean, you. you Google has a history of getting things done. That's true. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> so, uh, l- l- wait, wait, what's interesting about that poll? I mean, I think our industry is shifting. We are actually fearing legitimate entities more than cyber criminals, right? It was a, that was a government versus corporate America. Should where, we do the where was the organized crime? That, that was my maybe but, my bias. But I think it's really question. interesting. I, I think it's true. The biggest risks right now are not the bad guys. They're the good guys who aren't doing it. But wait, it right. that's not the question well, she asked. I know. Yeah, let's I ask, ask, let's that's ask the, the let's question ask the he's question. answering. <laughs> so we, so we do this in three, so, You're wrong. So it's, it's um, bad guys, uh, the, the non-government or Google bad guys. So corporations, government, or... Or, 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 or your, foreign your governments. Or, or bad guys. Or bad guys. Okay. <laughs> Wherever they happen to be. Who fears corporations the most? Governments. Yeah. Bad guys. Bad guys. And people feel bad guys. So let's talk a little bit about the bad guys, since we're sort of interested <laughs> Sorry, in that. Bruce. We can come back maybe to, uh, to standards. Um, what are kinds of attacks are we going to be seeing in the future from bad guys? And Marcus, you mentioned targeted attacks. We hear all these talk about um, APT and, and all of that. I mean, if we, in the scheme of things, are we worried about botnets? Are we worried about spammers? Are we worried about stealing PII? Or are we worried about um, espionage? Or, or, or is it really cyber terrorism? So, what are we really going to see? Well, one of the things, when I have conversations with people, it's almost... 
like they're oblivious in that certain other nations have industrial policy, and in the keynote spoke about this, they, they have a national industrial policy which says we'll go out and find secrets of our com- you know, competitors to our national preordained um, national winners, and we'll share that information to bolster our, our domestic economy. And we don't do that in the United States. We've never done that. So it's sort of like we're out there in the world with one arm tied behind our back, where we don't have an industrial policy to do that. A lot of other countries do. So, like, we start off the race, and we've already won one hand tied behind our back. And then we go forward from there. And I've never heard a debate between people saying, well, is it absolutely good for America to not have an industrial policy, or is it absolutely bad? We sort of start the discussion without even talking about the fundamentals. And Our, I think that's our, kind of strange. Our entire industrial revolution was stolen, uh, a stolen European technology, English, French, and, uh, and Scottish industrial but, uh, technology. Okay, so I'll say the last 50 years. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I've talked to people. I've, so I've we're, compla- to- we're complaining now that we're on top. Yes. Okay. So then we Just should all open up our cabinets and let everybody in? Well, I mean, there's, there's a problem. I mean, I think partly what's going on is buyer's remorse. We've got a lot of American corporations who've exposed their information way more than they probably should have, and now they're going, whoops, we screwed up, all of our, all of our stuff is leaking all over the place. Rather than fixing the problem or acknowledging that we made a mistake, let's blame the Chinese. But do you think, as a, and I'm just, I have no idea here, do you think we should have an industrial policy? Or should we try to convince other countries to not have one? I think convincing others to not... I, mean, I think it's certainly more moral not to have a society where we're, we're spying and stealing from each other. I mean, that is what we should aspire to. What you're saying is the reality isn't there yet, and, that, and that's a problem. And we, we have the problem if for, uh, for bribery. Right? United States corporations are prohibited from, from giving bribes. You go to some countries where bribes are expected and accepted... Yep. And we do business at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Now, either we accept that or we kind of fake it, right? We have a cutout within that company. We give them money to do administrative work and we try not to pay attention too closely on how they spend it. And and we probably do that for industrial espionage too. Right. Right. We don't do it, but we hire some companies to do competitive analysis. We don't look too closely on how they do that. And so circling that wagon, the reason I brought that up is what kind of threats are you worried about? Well, I'm worried about slightly different threats if I'm a big company right. and I'm the target of an industrial you know, campaign versus if I was in those countries and I know the government's kind of got my back. So this you, is... But this, but this is a matter of just, this is just a matter of business and good business practice, right? Apple manages to keep their latest shiny thing secret until almost the last minute, but yet the Chinese know, I, you know, this is going to shock some of you, but the Chinese actually know how they're built. <laughs> quite a long time before the Americans do, right? Because that information gets outsourced to the Chinese so they can build them cheaply for us, right? So we can see that some corporations are able to manage that process effectively and securely and enhance their business and get access to cheap labor, whereas other organizations simply can't keep a secret if their lives depended on it. Unfortunately, that's just evolution in action. They're not going to last very long. Now, Marcus I've heard, is right, and the rest of you guys but are But now wrong. I've, I've heard... <laughs> Now, I've heard Apple described as even worse than an intelligence agency for compartmentalization. Is that the best environment to work in? I don't know. I, ha- I love my iPhone. I know you do. I'd pay, I'd, I'd pay twice <laughs> But you don't work at Apple. No, no, I don't. But I think, you know, we're talking about when you work for the company who's being targeted by, for espionage, whether it's by a Chinese government or another company or something, you have the incentive to keep your stuff secure. Why aren't those companies doing a better job is question number one. And then question number two is, should the public at large, the government and the law enforcement and all the rest of us, should we be asked to kind of come in and fix the problem if they're not doing it right? Isn't it really, you know, where the market failures are, really somebody to protect my personal information, somebody to make sure that, you know, I think there's a shift over the last 15 years. I think we've seen, and Black Hat has been a big part of this, the rise of the vulnerability, memory corruption, and we've seen a co-evolution of memory corruption attacks got better, defenses get better, and I think that we're actually going to, we, we are seeing, I think, almost the end of the era of that sort of vulnerability, and 
that that's a success story, that companies are learning to defend themselves, we are learning to build better products, and I think the attacks are going to shift from here's an O-Day, here's the memory corruption, to much more attacks on the human beings, the socially engineered attacks. So, so this, and this is, I think, the value of, of the APT buzzword, which I actually hated for a while, and, I, and I've, co- I've come around. How to learn to love. Come uh, to love. <laughs> this is why I think it's important. The, it in, is the, in the normal attack, right, the attacker wanted some credit card number, some data, and, it didn't, and your security mattered in a relative sense. If you were better than the company next to you, you were okay. Right? In APT, the attacker wants you for competitive reasons, because you are a political organization, because you're, you know, you, for some reason you are the target. And relative security doesn't matter, absolute security matters. And the reason, your first question, why companies are less good at that, because this is freaking hard. Right. Right. Yeah. You know. I mean. Well, it's an unbounded. Knows, it's an unbounded problem. You can spend an infinite number of dollars on. Right. It. You all know somebody who does penetration testing for a living. Someone who's really good, and there isn't a company he doesn't get into. Right. Period. Yes. Right. We are terrible in an industry at dealing at this targeted attack. We're good at viruses. We're good at worms. We're good at stuff that randomly goes after people. We're terrible at this targeted. Those are all things where I can outsource the building of that knowledge base of what those attacks look like to somebody else who can write the signature sets with their research team. So let me give you an idea of where this is going to wind up. Probably somebody out in the room, one of your kids right now is having this idea of, you know what, I'm going to become a vulnerability farmer. I'm going to find a couple of guys and we're going to go work in the software industry and we're going to go get jobs at Knox and in software engineering companies and we're going to embed ourselves and we're going to build vulnerabilities and then we're going to cash out. That's where it's going. And I, actually, I believe this is done because right now there's a serious vulnerability market. Uh, yep. Governments are buying them. Companies are buying them. There's a lot of money, legitimate money in vulnerabilities. One, one of my former staffers from NFR went to work at, uh, at a company that makes network interface uh, devices, and he had his hands in the merged device driver for essentially every network interface card on the planet for the last four years. And, and he was kind of casually remarking, you know, I could have coded myself a couple million dollars of the vulnerabilities, and nobody would have ever been able to find them. And I thought, oh, man. <laughs> and then, yeah, then the market, <laughs> yeah, he would the- discover them, or his buddy would discover them, and sell That's the, right. Yeah. And then you go out and you sell them to the U.S. government. You sell them to NATO. And these are all... NATO's not buying. Okay. <laughs> but, but so, so, you could, so you could imagine a program in which I, I raised a certain amount of venture capital and I went to young, and, you know, young aspiring software engineers and I said, look, I'll tell you what, I'll pay off your college loan. But someday when you're, a, when you're a senior software engineer working for Microsoft or Intel or one of those companies, you're going to add a couple of lines of code for me. But why would you bother doing that? I'm so, so many of these companies are still not making investments in security development at all. You don't need to pay people to write these vulnerabilities. Their employers <laughs> pay them to write the vulnerabilities. Free. <laughs> and, and, and we, they write we themselves. Learned, we've learned to get better at getting these out of the code as it's being written. Yeah, but I mean, you're talking there, you're talking about inspired amateurs. Imagine what professionals would <laughs> um, accomplish me, if they deliberately left the wrong error check off. Let me ask what else, given the sort of rise of the targeted attack and what we do well and what's the really hard problem, what other kinds of directions, what direction should well, security the, professionals move in in terms of mitigating that problem, finding out what we need well, to know? I, I'll, I'll say one of the other things I'm concerned about, and it's more from recent personal experience, when there was this um, anonymous had announced that they were going to attack the root servers, and take down the root. And uh, I was like, okay, well, how are you going to do that? It's got to be a DOS attack. So you start looking into the size of DOS attacks that are possible today. And, uh, and so last year, there was, or two years ago, there was a flow that was seen was like maybe 35 gigs, gigabits. And then last year, there was maybe an 80 gigabit flow. And then earlier this year, it was just, there was a 123 gigabit flow. So wow, nobody defends themselves against 120 gigs. I mean, that's kind of tough. And so we've entered a realm where now it is impossible for you to defend yourself against a DDoS flow of that large. So what do you do, right? So it's funny, you talk to people at other companies and they list like, well, I've got my data loss prevention, I've got this, I've got that. Now as a line item right next to, I don't know, disaster recovery, you've got to have DDoS. You've got to have in your tool chest your strategy for when the DOS comes. And it was not like that four years ago. And so I think that's something that we're seeing that's changing. Yep. And you'd, I would talk to people in government because they'd be interested, well, what are we doing to protect the roots? 
It's like, well, when 100 gigabits comes at you, you can't do much. You can just split the problem, use any cast, right? Spread your attack surface as wide as possible. Now, that exposes problems in BGP, but, you know, that's, a diff that's not my problem with, you know, my problem's DNS. <laughs> my problem's not BGP. But th there are these old school attacks that have gotten to such a large scale now that now they're, they're beyond almost uh, managing. You know, and we're taking a very U.S.-centric view here on this, on this panel because, you know, all the other people out there in the world have to ask themselves, well, what happens if the, you know, if, the, if ICANN shuts off my domain or if Microsoft decides that they're going to revoke all of my software licenses for Windows or, you know, there's any number of places in which U.S. firms essentially have everybody by the short and curlies if we want to act unilaterally, you know, I would imagine that if I was somehow the CIO of some other country, I would be asking myself, how do I build a parallel ghost DNS infrastructure that I can switch over to in case I need to be able to keep functioning oh, if Google stops and, talking? And countries have already done that. Yep. Yeah. So an another thing I think, I think we're going to see a rise of is if we're seeing a lot more of these split responsibility stuff in the cloud, different end user devices, that a lot of our defenses are going to move from the technical area into the legal and policy area. And I, I would expect in the coming years to see more interesting contracts and you know, government involvement because we're getting out of, of some of the technical solutions. And if I'm using Dropbox, I can't affect them. I need, the only way I can get security from them is through some kind of contractual agreement. And we're still really bad at that. So sad to say, I think the lawyers are coming into our field. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. finally, so here's finally, the question. you've been here for 15 years. Yeah, I've been waiting for a long time. But you know, you, you, they're, they're, you're talking about about the United States law, but there's also the pro, you know other governments oh, too. Yes. And you know, the idea of I'm a different country. I want my internet to be run a different way. I don't trust these U.S.-based entities that control the domain name service or something like that. So I'm going to start. I don't, I don't trust sending my data across the border from the U.S. because no. The NSA is going to grab it all they and stick it grab in Utah. It all. So I have my firewall, or I make my own sort of internal network, and um, you know, I, and then I press for uh, regulatory action from the UN or WIPO or one of those organizations. And well, you know, I, I want to ask Bruce a question. So remember years ago when the insurance agencies were going to save us, insurance companies were going to gather enough actuarial data, and that was going to impose sort of some market forces, and it never happened. And then, but we were saying. Insurance has to work because if it doesn't, that only leaves regulation. <laughs> you know? And we've sort of like skipped right past the insurance phase and we're here we are at regulation. It's like, so tell me just what happened with the insurance. You know, I mean, it's a really interesting because I also thought that would happen, yeah. especially after Y2K. Because all the insurance companies, they all the lawyers up. got schooled on computer security because Y2K, and Y2K was a bust, right? Nobody made any money except. I mean, I'm, a lot of the except the COBOL programmers, <laughs> right? Right. So, so I thought they'd all be looking them. for what do we do now? We got all this sort of IT knowledge, and they looked at computer security and said, "Whoa, there's a lot of money we can make," and and they didn't, right? You know, there's no the liability. You know, just like look at it from the lawyer perspective. The kind of liability we're seeing for breaches, it's like, first of all, either we don't know about it. Right. And when we do know about it, it's like personal information's been stolen. You look at the, the lawsuits, people have trouble showing standing. The, the damage is hard to, sh even if you show standing, what the loss is is hard to show. And what's ending up happening is companies are being able to get out of these for, you know, a couple million dollar settlement, which for some of these businesses is, you know, yeah, chump change. And, and, and so the insurance companies could never get good action Trail tables, right? The technology moves too fast. Insurance companies are, have two, two, two models, right? There's the uh, flood model where everybody gets flooded out once in a while and you pay. And there's the fire model where at a consistent rate there are fires in the city and you pay. I mean, what model is computer security? Well, it's kind of both. And that's bad. So, well, so it doesn't fit in the standard model. Technology moves too fast. And the insurance companies said, whoa, you know, we don't want to have anything to do with this. It's, well, it's so too the, variable. And then you hear people talking in, uh, in regulatory areas saying, like, well, we'll regulate national breach notification. That will generate a certain amount of information that will then populate these actuarial tables. And then you move into the black swan scenario. Right. What happens if Sony was insured? <laughs> It, they would break the insurance company. Some kids with a SQL injection would wreck the insurance company. And so I don't know how you... SQL injection is a black swan? Well, no, against no, Sony's no, network. The, the, the Sony attack was so... Well, Sony and 
I mean, all the was, swans are black yeah, they, in they this. Just, yeah. <laughs> God, you ever seen a white swan? Right. I mean, the problem with Sony is this: they were just the public whipping boy for security for six months, right? Everybody right. who had anything, any spare time, said, "We'll attack Sony because they're the fun company to attack right now." <laughs> right. I mean, they, and they just acted clueless that made and made it worse. But insurance would not solve that well, problem. So insur- no. no, I don't think so. Insurance isn't solving it. We're not seeing liability rules so far that have really been productive in making people either buy insurance or bring their security up to snuff. Right. We're seeing increased discussion of government being the entity that sets standards either through soft power like purchasing and um, voluntary compliance where thereby you get some kind of liability reduction, for example, if you comply with these standards, then there can't be punitive damages against you. That's one of the provisions that's in the current Cybersecurity Act. We're looking at you know, more regulation that way. I, I guess you, you might want to say something yeah, about yeah, the, that. The strategy I see is the government says, you know, we really don't want to regulate because that makes us enemies and it takes a lot of time. What we want you, industry X, whatever the industry is, you come up with best practices and you adhere to it. And then what will happen is we'll say there'll be a standard and you pick the standard but we just want a standard. And right now, there is no real standards in, in the cyber area. And so they just, they're desperate to have industry figure out what are the standards and best practices and stick to it so we know who's the outlier. Right. And sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. Yeah, I mean, but, but they would prefer that over the, you know, the hammer of... You know, it works in the real world where you have you know, sort of negligence law and you have to do, meet the standard of care of a reasonable person. And in the real world, we all just have like an intuitive sense of what a reasonable person might do. There's a you know, mess in aisle four. Someone should go there and, and mop it up. And we don't really have that in the the world of computer security because most of us don't have any idea what y'all are talking about anyway and then you end up with this problem of like one expert versus the other expert and so it's really hard to we, both we, establish that kind of what that consensus is and then hold people to We it. have one federal case that now puts putting the onus on banks for, for security. I mean usually the banks will, will push it off and saying you know we, we did what was reasonable. There's one case where the bank was held they didn't do what was reasonable. And I think that if that continues, we're going to see more, more banking security against individual accounts. But that, you know, that'll be a good thing. You know, what drives me nuts about this is all of this becomes opportunities for someone to innovate and do things right and win customers by doing things right. That's and what I, I was going to ask you. What's the, what's the next step? Well, what do you recommend? I mean, if I, if, I was, if I was an executive for some kind of a bank or a online stock trading thing, I would have, you know, if you've got so much of your portfolio in our system, you know, you get an iPad with an iPad app that has its half of a public key pair in it and you can do your trading from your iPad for free and you get the slick interface and a free iPad but if you want to do it over the internet from a Windows machine then the liability is all on you. These are all places where people can innovate but consistently customers really don't seem to care because the innovation isn't being made attractive. Is that sort it's of not like being tied to a shiny thing. And I, I, I don't think that's feasible. I mean right now I mean, especially the younger people they expect to get their their, their documents, their mail, on the yeah. closest screen available. Yep. There's no specialized devices anymore. Well, remember when, when eBay gave away at Black Hat, I don't know how many years ago, five, six years ago, they gave away 10,000 tokens. And no one used them. And nobody used them. Yeah. I did, actually. Yeah, so did I, but, <laughs> but we're, the, we're the anomaly. Actually, right. actually you guys are three sigma, you don't count. Let me, let, me just, <laughs> let me just do a real quick poll. How many people in this room use the Google cell phone authentication system? Look at that. This industry sucks. There's so few people. I mean, everybody should well, be doing it. The rest of them don't use Google. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's amazing that we, we generally, I mean, it, that, that actually was a better turnout than, than, than at MISTI, where there were about four people in the room who went, oh, I've heard of it. Um, but, you know, here we are, we're the security experts, and we're going, oh, it's too hard, I'm not going to use it. We have a serious <laughs> problem. You know, could I, I asked this question and just sort of in a different context of these um, human rights activists from Syria and Venezuela and all these places. One guy had been imprisoned, and they were talking about using Facebook to organize. And I was like, dudes, why are you guys using Facebook? And they're like, it's so convenient. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, and that's the, I mean, convenience is, let's face it, though, you can complain about it all you want. Right. Convenience is really important. That's what we're going to go and, for. And it's going to win. And so, right now, more and more companies are giving up, giving employees laptops and cell phones. So, you know, you can't, I, I you can't we, say we no. I think we can learn something from this, though. And your, your point about the shiny 
is a good one. If you do things that appeal to people, if you entice them into doing what you want, you can get them to do these things. This is why I've been working in games for the last so, couple of years, is to make people excited about the things I'm excited about. And so we give away Elevation of Privilege, a threat modeling game, to get people excited, to be that shiny thing. And we, as a community, need to learn to do that with a lot more things. Because of this messed up dynamic is what led Nat Howard to say one of the most profound things I've ever heard about computer security. We were talking about something unrelated. And he said, you know, security is always going to get just as bad as it can possibly be and no worse. <laughs> right? because, because at the point where online banking becomes completely untenable, then everyone's going to go back to sleeping with a lumpy mattress full of, full of bills, right? Or, you know, whatever it is. We, so we get this dynamic where people are willing to push convenience to the point where it really starts to hurt them, and then they're willing to pay. And, uh, you know, I'm okay because I'm one of those weirdos who's, who's willing to put up with inconvenience all along. So all those other guys are just the canaries in the coal mine for me. Well, that but, assumes but we know, first of all, and we can make the decision to take our money, and that our money's there. And <laughs> we can make our... <laughs> right. We didn't make the decision to take it out and put it under the mattress. And, you know, these, as these technologies become embedded in everything that, all, every way that businesses run, that people communicate, that we run our daily lives, we're going to decreasingly have that option to really check out. And so, you know, what I hear you saying is actually one of the things that we need to be looking for with security is um, UI. Yep. You, you know? UI? I mean, Marcus is talking about convenience as if, yeah, convenience matters to people. Getting people to exercise and eat better, which will add years to their lives. We can barely do that. Right. <laughs> and we're, we're confused that they don't want to use this authenticator doohickey. <laughs> see, Guilty see, as you know, see that's, that's where it comes down to it, is you need to actually be able to tell somebody, oh, well, you know, you just led a life which was completely unhealthy. You're going to die early. That's not my problem. Just freaking die. I don't care. Right? <laughs> we need to basically do that, and we need to have the willingness to do that. You know? and, and I actually but had we're a network. Well, even if you thought that was okay for people, the network is like, you know, it's, it's the weakest link, right? right and so be, we there, don't, there, we don't have problems. that. We don't have that. Op we, we may have that option with each other, but we don't have that option with network computers. So yeah. what, so well, I was having a conversation with a friend, and I was up late, and I'm, I don't get to hack on my machines as much as I used to, but I'm sitting there, and I'm recompiling this kernel. I'm, my friend's on the phone. He's like, what, what are you doing? It's like, oh, I've got to rebuild my FreeBSD machine. It's like, you still run your own servers? <laughs> yeah. It's like, man, all my friends who used to be into that, they don't. You know, it's like, well, where do they host their sites? Oh, you know, it's an Amazon or this. And it's like, oh, well, next I've got to do something on my name server. Do you host your own names? Yeah. Doesn't everybody anymore? <laughs> like, no, no, nobody does that anymore. And it's weird that the, the, the security professionals themselves are, have lost control of their own infrastructure because it's convenient to outsource that and move on with life. I, mean, it's I, also I get that with email. I still use Eudora because I love Eudora. Oh, wow. I, 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 wow. I, 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 I'm becoming rarer and rarer. Yeah. And I had to switch to Thunderbird, but it, it runs in Eudora compatible mode. No, that's, that's just Eudora skin. That's not Eudora. Yeah. I mean, Eudora <laughs> is that, that's impossible. what I use. But, 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 you know, but I think you know, what you're saying is that these infrastructure providers have gotten reliable enough yeah. that for all of the worries that we might have, you know, keeping a FreeBSD server in your basement is no longer something that you need to do because you can outsource the power uh, and the right, but so, so, and so here we go. I don't get Fourth Amendment protection anymore. That's right. No, yeah. but you see, and you don't... Well, we're, we're fighting on that. No, we're seeing what yeah. we can do about that. That's you don't not a need to do it, but it's a good idea to do it, right? It's the same reason why if you don't understand how your car works and you take it to the shop, they'll tell you, ha, you got a broken Framus joint and the hay diddle diddle needs to be replaced. That will be $10,000, right? <laughs> and so if you get to the point where you have become so de-skilled because it's easier and cheaper to outsource knowing anything, then you just become a know-nothing and you're, you're completely vulnerable to all the people who are going to sell you aftermarket but services. most but, of but, the but, people but, on the network were, are, were they started like that, they've pursued persisted like that, and they will die like that. And, and, and that's the, but that's good. I mean, I, I'm not convinced that's bad. Right? I mean, the automobiles are sold to people like my mother precisely because she's not a mechanic. That's right. My mother uses computers as no, well. No, but, but the benefit of society is to outsource that expertise. And this is where mm -hmm. government steps in. Right? I mean, the, the, how do we solve Comp uh, auto auto uh, parts stores that do that—it's right. a crime. Well, see, and we, maybe we license. See, we are the mechanics. 
<laughs> let, let, me, uh, let me ask, we talked a bit about government, let me ask, okay, so let's have a scenario, you're the CSO, what are you going to spend your money on? What, what am I buying? What am I looking for in terms well, of security in the next, you know, 10 years? Am I, I, is it a thing I install? Is it a service I purchase? I, what am I, I, what, how am I protecting myself? I always argue that the best money you can ever spend are on your employees. Yep. I mean, yep. that is, you get the best return, the yep. best, yep. you know. And it's going to be spent specifically on uh, forensic and malware na- analysts yeah, and incident, incident response, response teams. Friend, and I do you know, some, some enterprise risk management so you can figure out how to allocate your people, you know, allocation of skills so you get some coverage. But in every situation I've been in, I rely on my people. I'm not relying on, you know, widget X. I can get almost every widget I need for free from the great open source community. I can't get the employees that And also, what you're going to want is you're going to want employees who are generalists, because what you're seeing with services like Amazon and all this kind of stuff is that you've got extremely specific services that solve one problem, right? Nobody's going to need to run payroll systems anymore because they can just go to ADP. But what, what, what that does is that means that your workforce, you need people who understand payroll systems in right. large rather than in the de- at the detailed level. So you're kind of agreeing with what Adam was saying before about assume, when you were talking about getting a forensic or a response team, you're like, assume you're going to get breached. Oh, 100%. Assume that's going to happen. And have the people in place who are kind of big picture people who are there to respond. Well, so that- I think what, it, it is. I think one investment people need to make is about configuration management and change yes. management. Yeah. Understanding the state of your systems, keeping them up to date, knowing... If something is breached and you don't know what was there before, you don't know what the attacker dropped onto it. And Gene Kim, formerly with Tripwire, has done some great work showing that people who focus on change management do an awful lot better. He's got amazing data. They they know something's out of place. Yeah. And so so that's what I'd focus my spend on as a CEO. So I think CISOs are being told a lot now stuff's moving to the cloud for financial reasons, for convenience reasons, for business reasons. You don't like it, too bad, stuff's moving out there. Right. So I think the CISOs are going to have to deal with that. And we get this a lot as security people, right? We don't get to decide how the business runs. We get to be told, we get to complain, and we get to do our best. And so I think there's going to be a lot of money spent on somehow getting back security that we're giving up. And I think it's going to be a lot of contractual and legal stuff. I think we're going to see a lot, as everyone else has said, on this forensics. Right, what to do after the inevitable breach, how to make sure it's short, how to make sure uh, you can recover, how to make sure you can go after the right. bad guys before they can do even more damage. How you can and share I, I mean, lessons I, learned. You know, as an industry, we, we've, we've been telling people, buy our stuff and you'll magically be safe. I like that we're now saying, God, you're screwed, buy our stuff after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a lot more realistic, a lot more sensible, and I think it's important. So let me ask, and I was thinking about this during the keynote as well, um, let me ask you guys, what do you think that uh, Stuxnet and Flame portend for the future of security? Do we just ignore that? How do we respond to that? What does that mean? So what, I've, I've got a little bit of a rant on that, <laughs> and, just, and then and I'll punt, you can punt do the do it short. Yeah, we have, so I'll be a short rant. So I always thought that these were tools that when in the spectrum of a, or a proportional force, you know, you have like really harsh words and dirty looks, and then you have like Mark II bombs. And in between, there weren't a whole lot of other tools. So for example, I think now for, uh, for policy, now maybe instead of blowing up a power plant and killing people, now maybe you can attack the equipment. And this is another notch on the sort of proportionality meter. Now, whether you agree with that or not, it's a new tool that will allow nation states to exert force without necessarily having to blow people up for good or for worse. Can I counterpoint on that? Yeah, I'm hoping. (laughs) I I think what you're talking about is a moral crime because what you're really doing is you're talking about putting civilian infrastructure on the front line of this non-existent war. Well, it doesn't have to be a horrible thing, but that's what's happening. The militarists are basically saying, look, it saved you a good old-fashioned bombing. You should be happy. That's what they're saying. That is not appropriate, Okay. I mean, we're talking civilian infrastructure, not military infrastructure. If there was actually a country that built its entire military command and control systems off the internet, right. sure, attack that. At that point, it's a military target. But when you're attacking the U.S. Department of Defense or you're attacking you know, the Iranian uh, uh, reactors, you're doing civilian infrastructure is your conduit for attacking that, that military target. I think it's horrible. It's a crime against humanity. Marcus so, I, is right. Jeff is wrong. So I think... So, <laughs> 
years. You're wrong. Hey, well, no. Internet is for uh, porn, next not ten war. Years, looking forward, we got two minutes. In the next ten years, and you can say this during the 30-second wrap-up, in the next ten years, what do you think will be the word that you use to sum up the state of security? Ten years from now, what's the thing that we're going to be on stage here talking about? In five words, Marcus. It'll be the same. Loss of control. Jeff? You're wrong. <laughs> Adam? Enticement in human factors. So I'll, I'll say it's incident response. It's cleaning up. Cleaning up. And yeah. do, you, do we have the stamina for this? Are we going to... We have to have the stamina. We better have the stamina. Yeah. We have no choice. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, aren't we optimistic? <laughs> <laughs> I am optimistic. I think no, we're going to have the, data. I think we're going to get better too. All right. So in the, in the grand lift locker, we talk about the same time. Are we, is things going to be better or worse, Marcus? Uh, same. The same. The same. Better. What's the question? Are better, or worse? Be better, better or worse? Better or worse? I'd say on, it's going to be. I, I, I look in the past. What problems have we absolutely 100% solved? It, and what problems we've run so fast we've just left behind? I just think we're going to get better at running. It will, <laughs> I think we've learned how to have. It we've will, learned how to fly it will airplanes be, and not have them crash. It will be good. It will be good if you're an incident response consultant, forensic analyst consultant, or uh, cloud computing patch up after leaks consultant. I like the idea that we're going to move towards generalists and sort of outsource. And, and the bad guys <laughs> will always run faster because they have a quicker procurement cycle. Yeah, they will, but like, <laughs> that's the problem but like with government spam? standard. But, but you know what? We're, we're going to get better problems. at follow the money. So when the bad guys do steal the money, we'll get better internationally at I following agree the money. With that. Really, yeah. what we need is trusted computing, where we just can't, you know, just run anything on our own servers in the cloud. Oh yeah, that'll make it all right? better. Everybody yeah. thinks that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. One more technological fix will definitely solve all our problems. Yeah, I think that's Indeed. absolutely just, right. Just buy my widgets. <laughs> buy my widgets. <laughs> um, Bruce has a book to sell. That's right. Buy my widgets, book. So you can buy his book. Um, with my last um, 15 seconds for this panel, I just would like to ask all of you guys to join me in uh, thanking the people on this panel for talking with you about this interesting topic. And thank you for coming. 